Congratulations to all of you for making it to the last panel of the day. Uh, my name is Adam Lashinsky. Uh, I'm a journalist based in Silicon Valley. I don't have any conflicts regarding Facebook to disclose, but I do want to tell you a very, uh, a very quick story, which is that in 2005, I wrote in Fortune Magazine what I think was the first mainstream article about Facebook, and I, I had heard about it, and so I called up Mark Zuckerberg and said, can I visit you? I did. I wrote about how there was a golden retriever uh, wandering around the office and how reminiscent of 1999 this was to me. And uh, I'm the person to whom Mark Zuckerberg handed a business card that said, I'm CEO dot, 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 and then an expletive, which eventually found its way into the movie, The, uh, the Social Network, because I put that in Fortune magazine. It caused great embarrassment. He said it was a joke. It was not a joke. It was, uh, well, it was his sense of humor, but um, anyway. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's what I go back to. Uh, my, my, really, my chief qualification for uh, moderating this panel is that I'm a longtime friend of Guy Rolnick's, uh, dating back to a business partnership that we had in Israel in 1999. And I used to take Guy around Silicon Valley and watch him terrorize uh, Silicon Valley executives. I don't know if, if Guy's here, but I, I'm a little disconcerted. Yeah. To guy, to see how, how cozy you've become with people in power, because that's not, uh, that's not your M.O. Okay, we have a, we have a wonderful, uh, we have a wonderful uh, internationally minded panel to discuss the other evil company in, in Silicon Valley, and, and that's Facebook. And um, we're, we're going to, I think, I think playing on uh, what was the most interesting part of a very interesting panel about Google that preceded us, which is, we're going to dwell as much as possible on remedies to, to Facebook, which is to say that, at least intellectually, we're going, to, we're going to presume guilt and, as I said, evil, and we're going to talk about what, what will be done ab about those things. We have, we have plenty of room to discuss whatever we like, including whether or not that's even a fair presumption. I'm happy for, for all of you to get into that. I want to suggest something slightly uh, uh, radical uh, following on the way Luigi moderated so wonderfully earlier, which is after a few introductory remarks, if any of you want to jump in, please raise your hand. I have no intention of waiting until the very end. If you, if you think you can ask a better question than I can, I think you're probably right. And so please do it. Uh, let's take the conversation where you'd like to take it. Let me briefly uh, introduce our panelists. Um, so I'm looking in, in my order on the list, so starting in the middle is Michal Gal, who is a professor of law at the University of Haifa and a visiting professor at the University of Chicago. I had lunch with some of your students today who spoke very highly of you. Uh, Michal uh, has, has authored several books, including Competition Policy for Small Market Economies. Um, Facebook's a large market economy, obviously. We're going we're gonna to talk about its influence on others. Um, seated next to, uh, seated at the end, is Nicolas Petit, the law professor at the European University Institute, who uh, got a little bit glassy-eyed when he told me about his couple years at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, where he not only had the opportunity to see real live Silicon Valley people in person while he was writing, but also to enjoy the sunny climate of Northern California. Um, he is the author of Big Tech and the Digital Economy, the Molagopoly scenario, and Nicola, before you, when it's your turn to speak, I'm, the first question I'm going to ask you is what a oligopoly is, is right. please. But, but not yet. Hold your fire for just a moment. Um, seated between Michal and Nicola is, is Matt Stoller, uh, founder, founder, yes, of the American e economic co-founder co of the American Economic Liberties Project, and um, li literally has written the book. Has, he's the author of Goliath: The 100-Year War Between Monopoly Power and Democracy. And if uh, any of you were here yesterday morning, Matt is, is, some, is somewhat shy and a bit of a wallflower, and so we'll try our best to coax something provocative out of him when we get to the remedies conversation, which will be very soon. And then lastly, uh, to my immediate left, the man who needs no introduction is Luigi Zingales. I um, had the great pleasure of inviting Luigi to, to a fortune conference that I ran two years ago where I organized a town hall meeting on, uh, on, on, uh, on monopoly power, uh, and, but this was a conference of technology executives, so I invited Luigi into the lion's den, and he did, he did not disappoint. Uh, it, it was great fun. So um, 
Michal, I'm gonna, oh, and, I'll, and I'll just share with you uh, the, the, quickly the order that I'm gonna ask everybody to speak and what, what they'll speak about by way of uh, framing our, our conversation. I'm gonna ask Nicola to start by talking about what's going on and what will go on in Europe. Michal to talk a little bit more about Europe and the rest of the world. Matt about the United States um, regarding Facebook. And, uh, and Luigi is what we call the X factor. He's gonna talk about what he, what he feels like talking about when, it, when it's his turn. Um, and, I'll, and I'll just remind you, I, just, I think it's very, um, very useful that, that we've heard so many things the last two days and we'll repeat some of, we'll go over some similar material, but we are going to be laser focused on Facebook, which deserves our, la our laser focus, frankly. So Nicola, to you please. Well, thanks a lot to them, and uh, I want to uh, thank Luigi, uh, Filippo, and Guy for the invitation to the conference and the excellent team that helped uh, support them. So the question was, what has been done in Europe against Facebook? Uh, what is the likelihood of remedies achieving their goals? So the simple answer is Europe has adopted this here. Uh, it's called the DMA. Uh, it's a legislation. It's targeted out at digital gatekeepers in, in 10 core platform services, so all of them are here including uh, cloud services, and the DMA here wants to improve fairness and contestability in digital markets. Okay, so what we have here, we have uh, per se rules of uh, uh, behavior, which basically tell platforms, you should not do this. And they are subject to very high fines, maximum 20% of the global turnover of the companies in the last uh, fiscal year, so that's, um, that's pretty, uh, pretty substantive. Um, the good news for enforcers is this should allow them to go faster. Uh, the bad news for antitrust law professors is that we don't get to teach market definition anymore. And uh, that's a very bad joke. Um, the bad news for economists is <laughs> the DMA leaves no place for efficiencies. And the good news for lawyers is that it's a Vietnam War for litigation. Okay, so uh, let's talk about uh, first how the DMA will hit Facebook then uh, what is the ambition of the DMA in hitting Facebook, and then maybe uh, whether this will create some uh, tangible results in, in marketplace uh, conduct and structure. Okay, so um, the DMA hits Facebook in two core areas, social network and uh, messaging services, WhatsApp. And what are the remedies that will apply to Facebook? Um, the first is a pretty broad restraint on Facebook's ability to combine personal data across businesses and personal data collected from third parties, okay? So the DMA tends to consider that Facebook's ability to combine and collect and process and cross-use all this data across the internet is a source of market power advantage and um, firms that are less diversified or complementers cannot uh, compete with uh, such um, a data advantage. Okay, so what is the DMA basically forcing Facebook to do? The DMA is basically forcing Facebook to require users to opt in of the combination of personal data across businesses. All right, so we are in the basic consent model where users will be presented the choice to consent or not consent to data combination. Right, so is this enough? So there's a, an ongoing controversy about whether this is well formulated in the DMA. Um, the DMA suggests that Facebook might just have to show to users a box which say, do you consent across the board to data combination? Is this enough? The DMA doesn't make consenting more costly to users than non-consenting. So, you know, maybe one idea could be to ask users to consent for each specific use across the internet, creating a sort of, you know, uh, cookie policy fatigue or increased cookie policy fatigue on, on users. So this is where uh, the discussion is, is heading these days. Um, the thing is not yet, the ink is not dry. So there are still a chance for the lawmakers to actually revise the wording here and there. And, and Nicola, let me interrupt you before you go on. On that specific point, so the ink is not dry on the legislation. That makes me assume that the ink has not even begun to leave the pen on the regulation. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct, yeah. So not only do we not know how this will be enforced, but we can assume, number one, that it will be litigated and appealed, and number two, that, it, that it's a ways off before it will be enforced. Yes. Very good. Okay, please keep going. So um, 
the, the second obligation, which concerns essentially WhatsApp, is a requirement uh, that Facebook opened up the system to interoperability, right? So the idea that Facebook will have to make the basic functionalities of WhatsApp interoperable with other providers of messaging systems like Signal or Telegram or other prospective um, developers. Uh, so the basic functionalities are text, voice, video calls, and file sharing. Uh, the DMA says, of course, you can restrict a little if there's a problem of security or safety or privacy or integrity. And the model for uh, interoperability is not, a stand is not a, an open standards consensus-driven model. It's basically a contract model where basically Facebook will publish a letter with terms of reference, and then this will be bilaterally negotiated between the interoperator and, and the platform. Okay, so the question is, what is Europe trying to fix with that, mm. right? So, you know, what, are, what is the ambition? And um, in the, the run-up to uh, the DMA um, uh, adoption, um, we've heard sort of, you know, really broad, eye-sounding uh, words like contestability and fairness, but there's been very little concrete discussion about what we want to get as, you know, market structure or market behavior in the future. And... Um, you know, it's a fair assumption at the same time that the lawmakers were writing this legislation with Facebook in mind. So, so what did they want except just, you know, saying, well, we're doing something about it. All right, so to start with the, um, the data combination issue, there were basically two ambitions which competed in the, in the run-up to, to the text. So one was a, a ban of uh, targeted advertisements. So the Germans, the, the, the Greens in Germany, we are extremely uh, uh, strong pushing for a ban on, on targeted advertisement. This was removed from uh, the discussion, and this might actually be adopted today in a more limited form in the DSA with um, um, a small scope. Um, um, so the ban would, or the limitations on targeted advertisement would be focused on advertisement to children or, or minorities. Um, so the other... Um, a possible ambition was to basically reduce um, levels of data extraction for users of social networks. But again, that's, that's not what the DMA is trying to do because if you understand the DMA, the DMA is targeted at gatekeepers. It doesn't say that rivals of Facebook on social networks should not extract as much as Facebook, right? So the, the notion that it's about reducing levels of data extraction across the internet is, is not found in this. The notion is you want to blunt the data advantage of Facebook and allow so other social networks to compete on, on better footing. Okay, so then there's the question of the WhatsApp interoperability ambition. I talked to people in Brussels uh, three days ago. They told me this thing comes from nowhere. We don't know what they want to do with that. So one goal might be to increase horizontal differentiation in messaging, so you want more diversity in availability, security, and privacy of messaging systems. Uh, the other might be to reduce the cost of multi-homing. So you, you know, it, apparently some people are very uh, anxious that they have to talk to one group using WhatsApp and then shift to Signal uh, uh, to talk to another group. Um, and another possibility, I think, which has more traction with me is um, initially there was this idea in the DMA that we should interoperate between social networks. It was dropped from the text. So maybe this idea, trying, starting with messaging, is a sort of test case for a future mandatory interoperability in social networks. And actually, this appears in a review close at the end of the instrument. I'm sorry I'm being pretty technical, so I'm going to the last uh, movement in the, in the statement, which is, uh, will this achieve anything? Mm. All right, mm. so, you know, as Steve was saying, the question that you have to ask yourself is, um, what is the objective you're trying to achieve here? Okay. And the objective of the DMA, if uh, we read it literally, is to increase contestability in core platform services in which you have gatekeepers. So in other words, you want to see a number two competitor to Facebook in social network. You want to see a bigger Bing in, in search engines. You want to see a larger um, competitor to Amazon in e-commerce. Okay, so uh, we need indicators to measure whether the DMA will be successful. And uh, what does history tell us about you know, potential indicators? So um, 
for Facebook, you might remember that um, the Apple AT&T app tracking policy um, delivered the big shots uh, to Facebook, which was reporting the stock market numbers a few months ago. So maybe the DMA in actually re reducing the levels of data extraction might have the same effect as the ATT policy of, of Apple. So we might actually see some contestability and some decline in, Facebook, um, uh, in Facebook's modes uh, through these numbers. So another indicator of, of uh, impact on Facebook might be to see Facebook pivoting more aggressively to more distant innovation trajectories. So, you know, the Facebook announcement that it was going, you know, um, um, uh, all in into the metaverse mm -hmm. might be, you know, reflecting this idea that uh, the business model based on software and social network is no longer seen as, as the, um, the, the priority trajectory and uh, we might go more into artificial reality devices and other things. Mm -hmm. Right, now, what are the risks that the European rocket, which promises the moon, redirects us to Kansas City? I took this line from Bill Kovacic. Um, in a better European analogy was, would be that the DMA promises Florence and gives us Brussels. Um, <laughs> uh, both cities in which I lived, and they are very different. Um, so one key risk for the DMA is that the gatekeepers will uh, litigate the instrument to death. And uh, they will litigate the DMA itself, but they will also litigate the GDPR, which is referenced extensively in the DMA, raising very complicated questions of interpretation. So more, um, more litigation, more you know, sort of GDPR2 debacle. The last thing um, that I want to say is uh, we might also see um, some spectacular failure on interoperability because firms like Signal, Telegram, and other messaging applications have already declared that they were not interested in interoperating with, with WhatsApp. Uh, in you know, very official statements, so um, that uh, doesn't tell us a lot for this obligation. Thanks a lot for it. Uh, no, oh, that's great. Uh, movie buffs might think, uh, we don't want your stinking badges, I think was the expression, right? They don't, they don't want this anyway. No, thank you. Um, I, I, two things. Uh, first of all, I, I'll do something Guy did earlier, which is in case you're not looking at your phones, the, the Dow plunged today, had, had a terrible day, and I, I I was just curious, I looked at Facebook's valuation, it's, 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 it's at 500 billion, it's about half what it was last July. So I think we should keep that in mind, For it, it, it tells us something. Before I go to Michal, I realize I promised everybody that I would give you a, an opportunity to explain what a oligopoly is. Please, briefly, Nicola. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a provocation to economists. I understand from yesterday's discussion that it's good to provoke economists a little bit. <laughs> And, um, and uh, also it's sort of, you know, typical French thing that we like to do mashups. So it's a mashup between monopoly and oligopoly. And it's supposed to reflect this idea that um, these, some of these firms might have very strong structural positions in market segments. For, that's the monopoly segments. But uh, at the same time take on extreme oligopoly competition in other market segments. And uh, if we think this way, we're seeing a different competitive reality with um, lazy oligopolists and uh, intense, intensely competitive oligopolists. Good. Right. I Good. hope that helps. No, it's very, it's very provocative. Thank you. Michal, please. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, Luigi and Guy and Filippo for this wonderful conference and for inviting me. These were an incredible two days. Um, I had a Facebook account that I opened for my class reunion, and then I closed it right afterwards, so I have no uh, conflict of interest. Uh, for my uh, opening remarks, I thought that I would make two points with regard to remedies. First is that I think that remedies should reflect what we already know, and uh, some of the remedies that are suggested just disregard what we already uh, learned from uh, past um, uh, remedies uh, applied. And the second is that I think that when we think about remedies, we should also take a global perspective rather than only a domestic one. So if we're looking, for example, and we're thinking about what's happening in Europe, it's not only an intellectual exercise, like a lab exercise, what's happening elsewhere in the world, but there are important externalities that I think one should uh, um, 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 talk about. So uh, let me start. So uh, with regard to the first point that um, 
uh, um, lessons learned in the past should be taken into account into remedies. And to make this at uh, this point, I want to use the DMA that Nicola has so uh, nicely uh, uh, presented uh, uh, the basics of it. And so the DMA is actually an attempt uh, um, to uh, recognize limitations in computational enforcement, to overcome uh, problems of speed and clarity and institutional limitations, and also remedial issues. Uh, and the way that I see it, it is an attempt to create some kind of uh, um, sharing or, or ways of data portability and interoperability in uh, uh, markets with platforms. However, if you look very carefully at at least some of the provisions, I think that things that we already know are not reflected in what is happening. So again, I am assuming that the DMA goal is a good one. You can, we can argue about that. Uh, um, I, um, I think that in some ways it goes too far, in some ways it, it, it doesn't go far enough, but we can leave it aside. Let's assume for a minute that uh, the assumption in the DMA that uh, the portability of data that comes from one's use of the platform, uh, um, uh, so, so that data could be um, uh, or should be ported or a user can ask that kind of data to be ported and that would create some uh, form of competition. Um, it's a very limited remedy because first of all, if we assume that um, firms have ill-gotten um, uh, advantages based on, on, on a data that they collected in the past, then this kind of remedy is not going to do um, enough. Uh, also think about the fact that each specific user would then uh, apport a small part of the data, only his personal data, and this would be asynchronous. So if you want to create learning, if you want to create economies of scale and scope in data analysis, that is probably not the way to go forward. But I think a more troubling thing uh, that I see there, and I see that in many other legislations, and not only in the DMA, but in other jurisdictions around the world, is a focus that we still have with, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, a, a very strong reliance on uh, consent. So we're putting the user in the driver's seat, which is great for probably political reasons, uh, moral reasons, for democracy, but is this going to assist competition? I think that basing uh, um, the regulation, or at least part of the regulation, on consent of the user is problematic, because just think about what we already know. And some of this knowledge even comes from the uh, University of Chicago, from the wonderful work of Omri ben Shachar and, and, and others. So we already know that users have a privacy paradox. We know that uh, most users do not understand the implications of combining uh, their own uh, data. Most think it only affects ads. Okay, so we'll get uh, better ads. Who cares about that? Uh, we know that there's a collective action problem. The users do not think about the externalities they create on other users when they share their own data. We know that uh, there's an asymmetry of power uh, that potentially affects the voluntariness of data. Uh, and of consent. We know that most do not read terms and automatically simply consent. Uh, um, we know from the work of Campbell and Tucker and uh, Wolfarb that users have a stronger tendency to agree to consent to provide their information to a uh, monopoly or firm that they are already providing data to in another form. Um, uh, we know from uh, the, uh, many um, uh, studies that um, uh, um, uh, the GDPR might even strengthen the already strong. And if this is true, basing some of the uh, uh, laws again on consent, uh, it, it, you know, uh, we haven't learned what we should learn. So should we take consent out of the picture? No, I think that we should look more carefully into things like default consent rules, create better default consent rules, or, uh, for example, I think that the devil is in the detail. If every time that I go to a website, I need to click again whether or not I agree to their uh, uh, policy or I want to change it, that is tiring, hmm. okay? I mean, why not once? And then it should remember what uh, 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 the type of uh, cookies that I want them to use or not, okay? So there might be even simple things that I think that regulation can do that we should learn from. 
So this was my first point. The second point uh, um, uh, relates to the global domestic of uh, uh, the global dynamic here, which I think uh, is interesting. Um, and I think this is something that uh, should be thought, thought through uh, by regulators and by scholars, and, but it's generally disregarded. And, and you know, there was a discussion uh, even here of many remedies in different jurisdictions around the world, but I think it's important to make the connection between them, to ask how they uh, uh, um, affect other jurisdictions. So let me um, offer to you several uh, um, scenarios that might play out with regard to domestic, uh, domestically applied uh, remedies. For example, I mean, let's try and differentiate the, the German Facebook case, which was brought by the Bundeskartellamt, with the Microsoft case, which was brought in the US, okay? So what uh, the German Bundeskartellamt, which is the, uh, I'm so proud I can say this word, <laughs> it's, um, it, it's the German uh, Competition Authority, uh, um, they, uh, they found, this was a court, the case that came all the way to the German uh, High Court is now uh, in Brussels, it, it, it heard by the Court of Justice uh, uh, in Brussels, but uh, what they found is that uh, um, um, by manipulating, uh, that the, sorry, that uh, Facebook manipulated its terms of use or its consent, and it was in violation of the antitrust laws and, of course, uh, uh, privacy. Um, so the, the thesis was that violation of privacy is also a violation of competition laws, at least in the Bundeskartell. Now, did Facebook then change its, uh, its international policy with regard to the kind of conduct that uh, the Germans uh, thought was anti-competitive? Well, it can only apply, it can differentiate, as long as it can differentiate the uh, uh, German population or anybody who's uh, German and using Facebook around the world, um, why should they limit themselves, okay? So one way is that you apply uh, uh, a domestic remedy, the platform only limits itself with regard to that conduct in the specific jurisdiction. Now, is this effective even in the jurisdiction that prohibits it? If we are concerned about learnings from ill-gained data, that might not be enough, because it might be the algorithms were learned from data elsewhere. And it might be that the firm might, might be able to use inference data from one user in another jurisdiction in order to then uh, uh, um, uh, apply to uh, uh, somebody, in uh, my example, to Germany. So, and both kinds of conduct that I just mentioned are not currently prohibited. So that might be one kind of uh, uh, dynamic. And I think even more importantly here, this kind of dynamic might even strengthen the advantages of international firms relative to domestic ones. Because if there are firms in Germany that cannot uh, uh, engage in the type of conduct which is prohibited, mm. but the international firm can do that elsewhere and then uh, transfer the learning to, uh, uh, and, and apply them to German users, it just created a comparative advantage. So this is one scenario. Another scenario is that the platform could not differentiate or does not want to differentiate. Maybe it's not cost effective. This is the Microsoft case, okay? Microsoft uh, was brought to trial in US courts, was found to be guilty, and, uh, 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 and it changed its, uh, um, uh, it's changed uh, uh, some uh, aspects of its uh, uh, operating system. Now, another, uh, this might, uh, so this might be bottom up, okay, so the, the platform might decide to do it by itself. It might be sometimes uh, uh, top down. And I think one uh, additional uh, thing to think about here is what a new Bradford also previously from the University of Chicago uh, called the Brussels effect, where what you have is the proliferation of, of ideas in a way, not only, okay, but I'm using it here, the aspects of proliferation of ideas, like the GDPR affected the CCPA, okay? So again, I think that once we think about domestic remedies, uh, uh, we have to think about uh, the externalities that other jurisdictions create on us and that we create on other jurisdictions. And this leads me to, to Final remarks here. 
The first is that I think it's important for jurisdictions to join forces in order to mm. think through okay, what would be good remedies um, it, for global firms. This is one point. And the second point is that it also strengthens the case for structural remedies. Briefly, before I move on to the United States with Matt, uh, I'm hearing from both of you a sort of confirmation of Christina's larger point, which is that Facebook, like Google, uh, sh should not be particularly concerned about any of this in, in the near or medium term. Agree? Yes. Yes. Okay. And I'll just, before I move on to Matt, I'll, I'll just also make an observation that you know, I sort of assumed that we would group antitrust and, and regulation on, on this panel. And I think we have so far, and that neither one of you mentioned antitrust. You did, didn't mention a, a, a breakup of, of any kind. So I can only deduce from that that it's not, not even not on the table. It's not in the, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not anywhere in the, in the whole entire region. Well, it's, 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 the DMA has a provision that say that in case of repeated infringements yeah. of the DMA three times, then structural remedies are on the table. If, you, if, we, if we catch you breaking the law three times, then maybe we will discuss something else which might entail uh, a, a breakup. It will take a while. Okay, fair enough. Michal, did you want to add anything to that? No, I, I completely agree. I, I, and I, I agreed with Christina before. I think that the idea of overcoming some of the problems that are inherent in, the, um, in, in, in antitrust uh, speed, clarity, institutional limitations, procedural limitations, uh, trying to overcome them by using competitional principles is, in theory, a very good idea, I think. However, the implementation... <laughs> but, um, Matt, before, before I ask you what remedies you would, uh, you would pursue against Facebook, or you think ought to be pursued or will be pursued, I, I, it occurs to me, listening to Nicola and Michal, that, that perhaps we shouldn't have glossed over the, uh, the Facebook's transgressions, and so I wondered if you would summarize them before you offer the remedies. <laughs> well, those, that was, that's what I'm going to talk about. Great. Right. Um, no, I mean, it, it, it's, I think that's an important, actually it's an important point, because when you, you know, when you talk about remedies and so, sort of addressing Facebook, solving for Facebook, you have to talk about what problem you're trying to solve for. So I appreciated both of you were approached your presentations by saying, you know, what is the problem that the DMA is trying to solve? Um, so I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna, first gonna sort of define what I see as the main problem with Facebook and then talk about the remedy that I think should be pursued and I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow, let alone what's gonna happen in, uh, uh, in US enforcement. But um, so what is the problem? And I would say that the problem, if you had to put it in a nutshell, is that Facebook and uh, a few other firms, but we're talking about Facebook, has centralized communications and the financing of communications through advertising data as well in a historically unique and dangerous way that threatens our democracy. And this induces a whole series of downstream problems. For example, it's killing newspapers. And America has relied on newspapers for over 200 years. And we don't know what a democracy looks like, if a democracy looks like anything, look, looks like a democracy without newspapers. But it's doing all sorts of other things. It's inducing young women to harm themselves. Uh, it's addicting us. Um, it, uh, it's fostering ethnic conflict you know, in the US and all over the world. So another way to put it is to quote Mark Zuckerberg, who said uh, at one point years ago, before he got some better lawyers, um, Facebook in many ways is uh, more like a government than a business. We are really setting policies. And I think that's the way to understand what Facebook does uh, and what Mark Zuckerberg, how he thinks, and how a lot of people in Silicon Valley think they are, they see themselves as the legitimate governors of our society and some of their scholars, Kate Klonick is someone I'm thinking of who talk about content moderation actually use this frame when they, she wrote a paper called The New Governors um, about the right way for Silicon Valley firms to organize the First Amendment. So that's what we're talking about. Are we self-governing or are we governed out of Palo Alto? All right, so with that in mind, uh, I'm gonna quote from uh, Rohit Chopra 
who joined the Federal Trade Commission and in many ways, um, I think in key ways, paved the way for what Lena Khan is doing and what some of the competition policy enforcers in the Biden administration in general are doing. And he sent a memo when he arrived at the FTC. And this memo um, was not explicitly about Facebook, but he said, um, very memorable line, FTC orders are not suggestions. Okay. And we talk a lot about the limits of antitrust and it takes so long and it's so hard. Um, and you know, they can just ignore the remedies or whatever. And I'm gonna talk about that. And I think it's kind of summarized in what he put forward, which is FTC orders are not suggestions. Now, when, I, when, he, uh, when he was one of five FTC commissioners nominated at the same time, and I met with several of them, and I said, hey, there is a violation of this consent decree from 2011, and the FTC doesn't have that much authority, but when you violate a consent order, they do, they have teeth. And I, you know, a couple of us said, really, you should use this. You can, you have $40,000 per violation. If you look at Cambridge Analytica, that's 87 million um, violations. I am not gonna do the math, but that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, that, you know, give or take a, a lot more. Um, and, um, you know, it gives you leverage, right? If you're, uh, if you're an enforcer. And so we suggested, hey, you should use this leverage in certain ways, try to say, get them to bar acquisitions, try to maybe limit lines of business. And the response was, you know, we, we might be able to do something, but there's, it would be crazy to do any of that. We might be able to find them as much as maybe $100 million. And they threw that out as like an outlandish and a crazy amount of money. So over the course of several years, you know, it, it became increasingly embarrassing that the FTC had allowed Facebook to do what it did, and it was a series of institutional embarrassments from the financial crisis and authority that they have over, over, over various things um, that they failed on. And this isn't to just blame the FTC. There were many reasons for that, not all of which exist within the building, but the, but the point is that there was a lack of, of legitimacy there, that a, a crisis of legitimacy there. And ultimately, the result was, in 2019, the $5 billion fine which was 50 times what they said initially and was still derided as a joke because it made no structural changes. And what we weren't after money, we were after structural changes. And Facebook stock went up by about $40 billion when that $5 billion fine came through, but it was still much bigger than what um, they had initially proposed. Um, but there are other consequences of the actions in the and the, the fierce political reaction against Facebook. Facebook was blocked from starting its own uh, currency, Libra. Um, it's also pretty much unable to acquire major actors and mergers. They, they can technically do them, but it's, it's hard to buy something big. So they're, you know, the multiverse, putting a lot of money in the multiverse, whatever that is. Um, and that's coming from an attempted internal expansion. But in most ways, FTC orders and this is not just for Facebook, they are still suggestions. And so the antitrust suit, which is probably the most powerful tool deployed so far, won't even go to trial until 2023, and then appeals will likely last for years. This is something that, you know, Bill Kovacic talks about, um, you know, the Google trials similarly. Um, and so Facebook does a lot of things in the interim, you know, whatever they want, really. They just promise to share data on, on democracy with researchers, and then they don't do it, right? Or, Julia Angwin talked about, oh, you know, they just routinely lie about the things that they're doing or maybe don't know that they're lying. Um, but this is what's happening, right? Because the rule of law for the powerful is really just a set of suggestions, guidelines, really. Um, so this, this, we're really talking, when we talk about remedies, you've got to start with the premise um, that we live in a society that is governed by the rule of law. And I think uh, there's really an open question there. And so when I talk about remedies, first we have to establish what the rule of law means and reestablish it. No big tech executive believes that anything will happen to them or their companies. And they, uh, they treat anything the government does as essentially something to game, right? They don't have to do anything, um, make me, right? So the information did a story on Jeff Bezos and the Amazon policy team lying to Congress. And, you know, in the article, 
talked about how no one at Amazon thinks that anything will happen to them, but also mentioned that, that when Jeff Bezos was asked to testify before Congress, internally the answer was, over my dead body. Eventually he consented to do it, and then the, the tech, there was a tech screw up. For, so for a couple of hours he was not able to, you couldn't see him when he testified. And then he only had to appear for a few hours, whereas the others had to appear for four or five hours. And they were high-fiving the, in the Amazon offices at the tech glitch. Right? That's the level of contempt that they have for our democratic institutions. So remedies won't happen, or they won't be meaningful. You'll get sort of silly things like the DMA um, uh, until executives feel personally accountable. Um, so here are a couple of charges that prosecutors could bring. So wire fraud, inflating video metrics. Um, Facebook knowingly inflated video view metrics, and I can go into a little bit on there, but just trust me, there's you know, there are lots of civil suits on this. An, an, another count of wire fraud, which, which would, um, inflation of advertising reach metrics. They were telling advertisers, you can reach 100 million teenagers or whatever in America. There are not 100 million teenagers in America, but they knew that they were doing this, overcharging their customers, securities, fraud. They lied to investors about it. And uh, violating the False Claims Act, the government is a customer of Facebook. And um, when you defraud the government, that's um, the False Claims Act. It, two WPP executives who sold advertising to the government were convicted of this in 2005, so it's happened. Insider trading, there are, um, there is good evidence that there was insider trading by Mark Zuckerberg and Shell Sandberg around Cambridge Analytica. And then there's, of course, the price fixing market allocation that we see in the Texas suit where Google and Facebook divided up uh, the ad tech market. So that's, you know, Sherman Act um, uh, criminal violation and so that's all doable, right? There's a, there are criminal violations here, or potential criminal violations here. So I'm gonna read you when antitrust actually worked. This was in the 30s, but we go a couple of decades later. Uh, so this is from Thurman Arnold in 1938. He was telling a room full of corporate lawyers, businessmen must realize that when they indulge in a doubtful practice, they are taking the chance of something more than an injunction. Um, he said that executives would do virtually anything to avoid the social stigma that came from criminal charges, even if the result was a small individual fine. And he brought criminal charges against the most powerful men in American business, like Alfred Sloan of General Motors. And he did that, and it was part of a immensely successful strategy. So he would offer criminal charges and civil charges simultaneously, and uh, said, you know, do you want an indictment, or do you want this settlement? And they would happily agree to the settlement. And so they settled market power problems in months, not years, not decades. So at a certain point, would uh, executives would line up outside his office and they would say, show us a consent decree and we'll sign it. Hmm. So it got to the point where just announcing an investigation would drop prices in that market by 18 to 33%. So he didn't think that these executives were evil and I don't think Mark Zuckerberg is evil or any of these people are evil. I think he thought that they were m more like Brad badly brought up pets, right? <laughs> They weren't trying to intentionally commit crimes. It was like reckless driving, right? Where you, a well-mannered man, well brought up, the bright future, accidentally killed someone, right? Didn't mean to do it. You know, didn't mean to induce genocide in Myanmar. But no man, no one would deny that such cases should be vigorously cross prosecuted, he said. So without the threat of jail time or social stigma, executives would just hire lawyers to bog the government down in long and costly litigation, or what Arnold called, quote, unemployment relief for attorneys. Um, and he said that, that the result of long trials is a complex court judgment, which are usually circumvented almost immediately. And during these suits, he said, attorneys live magnificently. So I don't really think it's any different today. Um, this behavior is wrong. Comp eliminating competition, stealing from, from people, manipulating, coercing, is wrong. It's, we need to call it what it is, which is crime. You know, just yesterday, um, a story came out that Sheryl that, uh, Sandberg got a story killed from the Daily Mail that made her look bad, covered up uh, some allegations of a, about a guy she was dating. And it was because the Daily Mail was afraid of retribution from Facebook. And it's kind of contested as to whether she overtly threatened them or not. But it's Facebook, right? Just that is so powerful. So Matt, excuse me. I know you, I know you have a couple more. I want to. Um... So let me just, I'll just get to the remedies, the specific remedies. Yeah, OK. Once you get that, sorry. So 
Oh, so once you get to the, all right, this is wrong, the remedies are pretty simple. Um, and they'll be accepted, because if the alternative is indictments and guilty pleas, they will accept them. And that's just, you know, split up Instagram, WhatsApp, Facebook. Um, Zuckerberg said he bought these firms to take competition out of the market. I don't know why that's not enough. Um, block them from buying any other companies. Purpose limitation of data. Maybe even getting away from surveillance advertising, move to contextual advertising. Potentially uh, mandated uh, destruction of algorithms. And, um, you know, there we go. It's not, it's not that complicated. The question is, how do you get around the procedural obstacles which we all kind of throw our hands up and say, oh, this will take forever, but it doesn't have to. Great, and I have, I have a bunch of follow-up questions for you, but first I want to hear Luigi's thoughts. So first of all, thank you very much for uh, asking me that, to be last, because being after Matt, you always look moderate by comparison, so that's, <laughs> that's a good beginning. Uh, <clears throat> but let remind you that uh, most of you are familiar with the uh, Chicago School of Antitrust, uh, but uh, may be less familiar with uh, what was Chicago before. And uh, not only the time of Harry Simons, who was a very aggressive uh, um, enforcer, or wanted aggressive enforcement antitrust, but also a younger George Stigler. In fact, uh, in 1962, he wrote a famous piece in Fortune um, from the title, the trouble with big business, uh, in which she advocates the breakup of big companies. And not only advocates the breakup, but uh, makes a very important argument, uh, very Stiglerian, say uh, the breakup is not only the right thing to do, it's also the conservative, capital C, thing to do. And now you read it today, say, wait a minute, this sounds like Elizabeth Warren. What is so conservative about it? They say, no, no, because the alternative is regulation, and uh, regulation is much worse. This is very Stiglerian, so I prefer uh, the breakup. And uh, when I wrote my book uh, 10 years ago, I actually did not know that piece, but I have a chapter where I talk about remedies, but not, not for antitrust, uh, and I say, uh, keep it simple. Uh, why? Uh, for two very simple reasons. Number one, because the only chance we get decent uh, legislation pass if it has public support. The only way in which has public support is that it's simple. If you are starting to talk about uh, something that requires 300 pages, you're sure that nobody reads it, including the congressman or congresswoman. Okay? Who we know. <laughs> Who wrote it, yeah. Uh, the second is because the moment we do things complicated and we are, and Matt will be happy about this because I blame us economists, but we are uh, number one in that because we like to show how smart we are and do a little bit of mechanism design and complicated things, et cetera, to, to get an epsilon efficiency in the, uh, in the mechanism, forgetting that the most difficult part, as we discuss here, is the practical application of it. Okay? In the practical application of it, the more complicated you do it, the, ch the, the bigger the chance that uh, lawyers, lobbyists, et cetera, will actually divert it and use it against you. And actually, there is a passage of Brandeis that say exactly that, that uh, don't overtrust uh, the legal remedy because the legal remedy uh, will be easily captured by the very interest that you're trying to fight. Now, Given that, you say, okay, then, then you have no remedy, let's go home, no. Uh, since I don't want to give this satisfaction to Fiona, let me try to suggest some, uh, uh, some remedy. So, um, I try, but, but this, this uh, principle, this, uh, this Tiglaria principle, I keep it simple, is really what uh, inspired me when I try to address the, the, a problem. And uh, so the problem with Facebook is uh, there is a clear, big network externality in posting. I'm not saying anything that you guys don't know, but I think that that's the, the source of the problem. I want to post my pictures where my friends are, and they want to post my picture where I am, and uh, it's very difficult to move from one network to another. And, uh, and I remember the last year when uh, WhatsApp uh, created new uh, privacy rules, there was an attempt of my group of high school friends that were all in uh, WhatsApp to move to... Um, I think it was Telegram or Sigma, I forgot which one, 
And uh, it lasts for three days, we went back. So the, the, the attraction power of this disease is enormous. However, the problematic part of Facebook is not the posting. The problematic part, as Francis Fukuyama said very clearly, is uh, the part of uh, editing. And not only editing, it's a business model that basically wants to make you addicted and uh, tries to stimulate you by showing you uh, the worst things possible. Uh, um, and this is, by the way, fair uh, rule is not just uh, Facebook. Uh, YouTube is the same. I once uh, was trying to find a lecture of Chomsky. I, I, I would uh, watch a lecture of, of Chomsky online on YouTube. Immediately after, I start to receive a suggestion for a strange TV I never heard of. And I look at, and uh, believe it or not, is the uh, TV of Chavez in Venezuela that immediately get to, you know, like uh, all the most radical uh, uh, messages just because I uh, committed a crime of uh, wanted to see one's Chomsky. So I think that this is uh, the fundamental problem. Now, uh, the part that I think that uh, Francis, in my view, uh, get it wrong or is not aggressive enough is that he hopes that uh, uh, people will come. And uh, the problem is it's a vertical foreclosure. If you have the monopolistic component of posting, uh, you subsidize with that all the rest, nobody will come to do the editing. So if you want to create competition in the editorial part, like um, uh, Francis is suggesting, you need to break up Facebook and here I'm talking just Facebook, Facebook, we can think about Instagram, et cetera, but mm. break up Facebook along the line of one, a place to post where everybody is allowed to post, like everybody is allowed to print his own newspaper. Now, uh, in the past, there were the neo Nazi writing their own newspaper. Nobody knew the, where the newspaper was, and uh, you need really to be a neo Nazi to find it out, okay? So I think that uh, uh, in, in Facebook, I'm not saying that neo Nazi don't have the right to post on Facebook. But it's very problematic to find them. And, and so unless you're neo Nazi yourself, you're not going to find them. So I think that uh, problem number one solved. Problem number two is you are going to have to regulate the monopoly because that's a natural monopoly. There is uh, uh, infrastructure is, uh, uh, if you want, uh, mental infrastructure of connection, but is infrastructure. And uh, that should be regulated. And then you are going to have all the uh, various middleware that are competing uh, but they need, in order to create a space for competition middleware, you need to break up the posting function from the editing function, and if you are in the posting function, you cannot be in the editing function. So a structural separation of the two businesses uh, with two different uh, uh, activities, and then competition about this business so that people can choose uh, what they want. Because uh, honestly, what uh, Francis is saying, I, I love the idea of competition, in among uh, uh, editing jobs, but it's impossible to have competition if you don't intervene massively because this is really going to the business model of Facebook. So Facebook will do everything in its power to get to prevent that somebody gets between uh, Facebook and the clients because that's where the value is. And so if you want to do that, you have to do it with a very sharp and, and uh, 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 regulation. Now, people might say, oh, but what about if there are some economies of scale in the data? That uh, if I have, if we have the New York Times editorial system and the Heritage Foundation editorial system, they're going to start to collect data uh, from different people, and we're going to not reach uh, the massive amount of data that the Chinese have, and so we're going to have to, uh, we're going to be outcompete by the Chinese in war because uh, that data was crucial. I'm exaggerating a bit, but not too much, because that's what people say. And uh, this is, again, where we need to think about a way to share the data in a way that does not create uh, uh, the problems Facebook does. And I don't have all the, the solution, but I think that that's the direction I want to go. And since I promise, uh, Steve, what do you do with, with Google, uh, my view is to do exactly the same thing. You have a natural monopoly, which is search engine. They were better at uh, indexing pages. Not only that, it's an algorithm that fills itself, and so the more you search, the better it is, and at this point, is absolutely a natural monopoly. So 
Um, how do you do it? You separate, uh, like you do in telecommunication, the natural monopoly from the rest. In telecommunication, if you have the last mile, you, what you do is you force a unbundling of the network vis-a-vis uh, the last mile, and you force who has the last mile to give at a certain price to all the values uh, competitors so they have ca to have competition. So here is the other way around, is you can create uh, the competition at the last mile by adding different uh, um, browsers, uh, and uh, all the browsers are going to use the same search engine, that is Google, but they offer different privacy options, uh, different uh, uh, amount of uh, ordering, depending on the, the ca what the customers want. And yeah, of about, course- But what you, about Facebook? You, yeah. You're talking about Google, but- I, I, This is for Google. I'm, I'm just saying that the, for Google, you can fix it in ways. For yeah. Facebook, yeah. again, you are going to have a natural monopoly in posting. Yep. That will be a regulated natural monopoly. Okay. That you have, a, have a, f a price that is a regulated price for all the, p the various editorial functions. And those editorial functions will compete. OK, so I want to uh, do two things. I want to, I want to, bring, us to bring us to reality for a, for a moment. Because we've heard in, in, in Europe, the reality is, is that there's some fine remedies on the table, and none of them are going to happen anytime soon. And the United States, we know that there's no prosecutors who are going to bring criminal charges against Facebook executives anytime soon. Matt, you're welcome to, to disagree with me. And Luigi, the Justice Department isn't bringing an, a, 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 a case against Facebook to break it up. The FTC is bringing a case that will go on for, for many, many years. So uh, in, the, in the near term, none of this will happen. But, but go, go on, Matt. Oh, I just think it's speculative to say what the, what the, the DOJ will or won't do. Uh, I mean, Jonathan Cantor, a couple of months ago or weeks ago, said, talked about um, the uh, bringing back criminal prosecution of Section 2 claims. Yep. And we don't know how that's going to work. Yep. We also don't know what scandals are going to emerge. Yep. Um, I want to pause and ask if anybody wants to ask a question right now. Otherwise, Fiona, you do. I, I love that idea. Yes, please. The microphone's right near you. <laughs> um, I have a paper with Michael Cadis where Hold we describe. There you go. Hello? You're good. Yep. I have a paper with Michael Cadis. It's up on SSRN where we describe a way that interoperability could be used as a remedy for the FTC in the Facebook case. So rather than do what Luigi, Luigi, I thought you were on the train until halfway. Um, and what I, what I think is very hard is about this regulation piece. If you turn social networks into some, like email, where I have an, I can, as an ISP, if I can get my clients and I can charge them a dollar a month or sell them advertising or whatever, and then I can connect to the network and connect to anybody. So I think if you, if you let, um, if you required Facebook to open up the API so that simple things like um, Nicola was talking about what the, the DMA does for text, images, video, if you did that for social networks, then somebody could enter with a site that promised to leave you feeling happy and fulfilled and not angry and not addicted and could sell you advertising and support itself and you could keep in touch with anybody you want on Facebook. No, I, I agree, but sorry, the, the experience uh, of open API in banking in Europe is far from perfect. And the answer is that uh, if you want to drag your feet, uh, you can drag it very, very well. And says Microsoft is the master in this. How do you undermine the effort of a competitor that tries to get... Uh, in, uh, no, because uh, they can't even be in that market. They... They, uh, they structure a separation, and so they, they have to uh, just contract with the various guys, but they cannot be directly competitor of that. Otherwise, they're going to drag their feet. Uh, Fiona, Fiona, can I ask a question about your solution? Do you think that it's workable if Mark Zuckerberg is intent on sabotaging it or capturing it for his own purposes? Well, if you read the paper, we have a lot to say about how the FTC would implement this remedy. There would have to be... A regulator that approved each change to the API because otherwise what you're describing would happen. Uh, the dominant firm would have an incentive to make sure the interconnection didn't work in the way that AT&T did back in the day. 
Uh, so you would need to have the APIs be approved before they could be changed. So, so you're saying that with a much stronger regulatory climate in the 50s and 60s that couldn't tackle a simpler business like AT&T, you're proposing to do that now with well, Facebook? Uh, so, and you think I, that would, that's administrable? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I disagree with it entirely with your premise. I think what's happening here is that you have APIs that are far easier to deal with than sheds with switching equipment in them where somebody has to have a wire and property rights and get into the shed and mess around with the machines and so on. These are just interfaces. And standard setting organizations do this all the time. So it's a completely common thing. I know Michal and Nicola want to comment, so let me, Michal, please. Okay, um, I completely agree uh, um, that um, interoperability is extremely important. I think it should not be standalone. I think that adversarial interoperability is what we're talking about. Of course, mandat mandating interoperability. And I think it's especially important because um, uh, what we find today is not only large firms that operate in one area, but I think this is something that I haven't um, heard, uh, that, that haven't uh, heard that comes up, uh, came up. It's the uh, um, data ecosystems, okay? These are completely different business models where you might have a core uh, um, uh, um, uh, market in which you're operating, but there are many externalities with regard to many other uh, businesses in which you operate and there is a dynamic between them which creates very um, uh, much higher, sorry, um, um, access uh, barriers uh, for yeah, other firms. So interoperability can work. Again, I think the devil is in the details. I mean, who determines the standards of interoperability? Is it the large firms that determine it? I mean, again, this, I think, uh, it, there's a role here for the regulator. I know that in the DMA, they have some kind of provision that they might require standard setting organizations to do that. That's not going far enough. I think that once you put interoperability, you also have to put in in, uh, uh, you put uh, standards as well um, uh, immediately. And I should also say that last June I participated in an OECD roundtable that uh, um, uh, asked the question of whether degrading interoperability and port data portability is by itself an antitrust offense. And I think that the answer there from most of the experts and most of the people around the world was yes. Mm. So that's another possibility. Nicola, please. Yes. So. I'm not sure I understand the idea concretely, but the way I visualize it is, so you would reinstate a world in which you would have a, a generic social network UI, and there would be no editing on it, it would be a wall like uh, Craigslist or Wikipedia. There would be no curation, and then all the editing and curation functionalities would be outsourced to a marketplace in which editors would compete so I think that's, you know, that's potentially a good idea, and you know, why not, rather than jumping to this uh, other equilibrium state, why not experiment? So why not, you know, say in a region, in a country, we force Facebook to do that, to organize that? Um, and then you have to think, so if, if you want to do that, and then you, you see the results, and you see whether there's demand for that kind of world. So then the question becomes, what, do you, what kind of legal engineering do you need to realize that experiment? Um, and one is you don't really need a structural separation to do that. Yeah, that's You'd need some functional separation of editing and, and basic UI functions. You don't need to, you don't need to you know, divorce the corporate links between the two No, companies. You, you do need. Uh, Why? Because otherwise you have the problem I was discussing with Fiona. You have the sandbagging. If I can be on both things... Uh, I'm not going to make it easy for, uh, for you to compete. Right. I'm going to do the opposite. Okay, possible. well, then say you have an agency in charge of making sure that there is a portability mandate no, and an access mandate. No, but there's also the subsidization because uh, all the, the value, if I control all the data, I can offer my service at a much better terms than everybody else. And so you need the structure separation. Okay. And I like the idea of the experiment, so if you want to try in, uh, in yeah, which European country? country, yeah. yeah which, which country? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Canada. Maybe yeah. Israel. <laughs> Israel would be or a good Belgium. country. I'm not living there anymore. <laughs> I want to I wanna get to Austin, please. Okay, if you want to pick a country, pick a country that has its own language. Pick Finland, where <laughs> everybody speaks a language that's unrelated to any other language, and you, you can they run They have other problems, right? But, um, <laughs> Maybe not now with Finland. I guess <laughs> Maybe my, not now. Yeah, not at the moment, but... Um, <laughs> 
I guess my question relates to kind of Matt's remedies and Luigi's remedies, and it and I it's just a nagging feeling that I that could you get politics out of it? So in Luigi's, you're, the argument it's a natural monopoly and we regulate it, or even interoperability, which has been a good success in the telecom space for the most part, all of those require a level of active observation, regulation, and monitoring by government officials right. that would definitely leave the law's enforcement open to choking off the resources to the, the... The reason the DOJ actively avoids regulatory solutions in mergers, you could envision a whole bunch of mergers where they say, okay, we'll do that, but then you have to agree that you will not raise prices and we're going to have someone regulate you. They absolutely don't want to do that because they perceive correctly our whole enforcement budget is going to get sucked into trying to enforce this. So in high tech markets, I think this idea of let's make a natural monopoly of a thing that's, that's where they're innovating massively every two years, that seems hard uh, in, in politics. And on, and on Matt, on, on those remedies, I see, and I'm kind of intrigued by, here are criminal violations, and we can use these criminal violations to kind of twist your arm to agree to these competitive changes. W would that not, if, if we just back up to the middle of the Trump administration, if you gave the, if you gave that muscular power it, it seems like politics would make that a kind of a scary moment. And would there not be a revolt? When the FTC got its most muscular in the Carter administration, the first thing Ronald Reagan does is come in and say, we're going to just change the rules. The FTC can't do that. Um, so, so I wonder whether these are more than kind of stylized examples if you actually started to do it if the politics would mess yeah, up. Yeah, Matt, would you, why don't you address that and then I, I want, Michal has another remedy for us. So you're saying that the, the, you don't want to give Trump the ability to throw rich people in jail. Is that? No, I don't think he would aim for rich people. I think the FTC <laughs> under, <laughs> under Trump in this, they, they, would, they would, Ron DeSantis would be the president, let's say, and, and they would go after Disney and they'd say, if you don't do X, Y, and Z, you're violating this Florida law, the don't say gay bill. You violated that bill. We're going to come after you on a criminal basis unless you agree to put up our ads, or, you know. I'm, not, I'm just kind, kind of confused. I'm not, I'm not totally understanding your point. Can you try to rephrase it? Well, I think I can, I can help. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, my, my response to you would be that, that Matt's not suggesting anything radical. The Justice Department has, for example, he said price fixing uh, statutory authority, and then he sees price fixing at, at Facebook. He's just he's offering them a suggestion of of, of going after them on that. But it, it sounds like criminal enforcement of Section Two. That that would that would be pretty different. That's it's not the Sherman Act cons conspiring to fix prices, criminal felony, is written right in the in the thing. This would be in a, a much more muscular expansion. And I could see that it could it could be effective in, in in getting them on board. I just I am worried that when when you move into new things like this, would we'll give you new weaponry to take over. It's like militarizing the police forces. You know that. I mean, that's it's Austin's suggestion. Your 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 mere suggestion is, is dangerous. Is fright is frightening to him. That you're you're giving the wrong people bad ideas. Well, I think there's, you know, one could characterize it as, as sort of inventing new legal authority to, for new kinds of crimes like doing things Ron DeSantis doesn't like. And I understand why you would be concerned about that. I would be concerned about that as well. But I, I, that's, um, that's not actually my proposal. I'm, I'm saying, you know, within the bounds of the law that we have, which has to be enforced in a, you know, politically neutral way um, and is not, has nothing to do with Ron DeSantis' preferences. Um, you know, just if, if they violate uh, criminal statute, like inflating their um, advertising metrics um, and, and stealing budget from 
uh, firms that are spending money on advertising or from the government, that you should enforce the law and that, that law can the, be. And, and that part I, I agree with. My question, as you move toward the FTC getting more muscular, then that's the other side, which is when we've done that the FTC in the past. FTC doesn't have criminal authority. So. Yeah, I, but the well, let me let me give anything you a different that derives so, from, so the, D Dina, from the legal basis. If Congress gets upset and says we're going to take away the, D you so know, Dina, the more aggressive you get, the more we take it away. Dina's theory. Um, so I want to just mention one thing about yeah. high tech markets that I think speaks to. Um, so in in two thousand AOL Time Warner merger, the worst terrible merger. But one of the things they did say is AOL Instant Messenger has to open up, and that's why you had actually, which is a proto social network. That's why you had a bunch of competition in that market. But they wanted something, so they, yes. that's why they said they would do it. I just don't think the regulatory governing competence exists today to do that. But uh, I think just to your, um, you know, to the basic point here is right now we, we uh, these guys just don't think the law applies to them. And the only way to make it apply to them is to make it apply to them. And, you know, we can talk about I, I, th I think most of the remedies that people put on the table are good ideas. I would love to see interoperability. I would love to see um, uh, you know, com competition among news feeds. I would love to see divestments. Uh, all of these things make a lot of sense. I would love to see a healthy social media marketplace. Um, I just think that the, the, the sequencing is really important. And the sequencing has to start with FTC orders or, you know, DOJ consent decrees are not suggestions. The rule of law is not a suggestion. Right now we have a crisis because the rule of law is a suggestion. Now an alternative to that is we just change it and say like Ron Santos gets to do whatever he wants. I think that's a bad way to go. I think that's sort of authoritarianism, but sort of, sort of saying that uh, FTC orders are suggestions for the powerful, I think does actually lead to that. Whereas actually saying the law applies to everyone, whether they have power, or whether they don't, actually kind of regains faith in democracy. Look, I just, uh, I want to come to Michal, but I, I do want to point out to Austin's point, you know, Guy asked Lena Khan today, well, how about uh, banning uh, Mark Zuckerberg from, from, a, from social networks? And she didn't answer the question, but that's exactly what you're, that's the sort of thing you're talking about. It's, it's worth, yeah, okay, but it's, 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 it's worth raising because it's an important point. But go, go ahead, Michal. Right, um, um, well, um, Matt cited a term in Arnold. I want to uh, cite uh, Isaac Asimov, um, who said that the saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. So, and I think that this is true today as well as it was in the past. And so I think that one of the things that especially uh, um, us as academics uh, should do is probably try and think a bit outside the box, not only go to the trivial remedies or the ones that have been used in the past, but also think beyond them. So some things that I want to suggest, and again, some of them might sound uh, logical, some of them might not, uh, but um, uh, one thing that can be done in order to uh, uh, maybe create more competition with regard to data, if data is uh, um, a part of the a rule, um, part of the game here, is to create data exchanges, and you talked about China before, China has um, uh, uh, is in the process of creating such a data exchange. Europe is also <laughs> talking about that. Maybe that can get us at least part of the way. Another thing that I think is more provocative here is, uh, and this is something that Nicolai and I have written about in an article which is called Radical Remedies for the Digital Economy. Um, we suggested uh, sharing the sharing of algorithms. So the idea here is, let's assume, okay, for the, uh, the sake of argument here, let's assume that Facebook actually did what uh, uh, um, uh, it, uh, it is claimed that it did, and it actually blocked access of uh, uh, its rivals to um, essential data that would have allowed them to compete, okay? So, what Facebook is uh, currently enjoying are ill-gotten gains, ill-gotten data advantages that other competitors could have enjoyed if, he, if Facebook did not engage in such conduct. If so, the idea is that we can then share the learning from that ill-gotten data rather than sharing the data. And this is a bit, if you'd like, like the uh, fruits of the poison tree. Okay, and why is that? Because, uh, and, and, and why might this work? It might work, I mean, this kind of remedy 
uh, uh, has a lot of advantages. First of all, algorithms are non-rivalrous. Many can use them at the same time. We are not sharing data, okay? So that means that we don't have issues with privacy, okay? That might be another uh, um, limitation of data sharing that we are overcoming here. It allows firms to catch up swiftly if this, if, if this learning is relevant to their operations and it does not require continual supervision. So you have a lot of advantages here that might jumpstart competition, again, assuming that we find that Facebook has indeed engaged in what is claimed. And Michal, I, I presume you, you would, in, or, or how did you two frame how this would come about, through regulation? Yeah, okay. uh, well, no, no uh, uh, yes, but it can come as a court remedy. Or, or, or legal, okay. And I just wanna point out, it, interestingly, this is what Elon Musk is suggesting for, for Twitter because I think, be, presumably because he <laughs> thinks it's a better product idea is for the algorithm to be open sourced, which is analogous to what you're suggesting, yes? Well, I, I, again, I, I can't relate to, to the uh, uh, um, Twitter. Um, uh, it's hard to relate to. Yeah. <laughs> to Elon Party, Musk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but also because I don't know enough, so I don't, um, <laughs> I, I, uh, but. Um, Again, I pointed out to people the way academics think differently from journalists <laughs> on the subject of, of, what, of whether or not they know enough to comment, <laughs> but go ahead, I'm sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> but I should say that it's not open source here. I mean, the idea, uh, I mean, it is, uh, I would open it, or we would open it, only to uh, uh, firms that can actually uh, I mean, there's a good potential that they would become competitors. Right? I see, in a qualified sort of way, not, yeah. not open source. Not okay, terrible. okay, good. Uh, Filippo, please. Thanks, uh, very interesting discussion. So, I think, summarizing the panel, one of the main conclusions is that any kind of behavioral remedies pretty much failed or doomed almost from the beginning. We need to go to structural separation. We need to discuss how much, what kinds and uh, what types. So, I, I wanted to ask, uh, so in Vert, this, this is a very extreme remedy, no, in a way. So, do you think that we have enough evidence right now to do this through a liability regime like antitrust, uh, or and, and so f from what you've seen, of course, like from what you've seen so far, do you think that this is warranted, and uh, or, or if not, do you think that this should have been imposed through direct regulation because we just think that that's what should be done for democracy? So I wanted to ask, like, is this a liability regime or is this a regulatory regime? And if it's a liability regime, have we have we reached this point already? Well, yeah. Why don't we ask everyone, starting with Nicola, to address that? Yeah. So I th I don't think that breakups are the solution to the problem we're facing. I think we are here discussing like in, you know, Moliere's um, comedy, like uh, 17th century doctors with very bad uh, science. And we are playing with three remedies like, you know, bleeding the patient, uh, purging the patient, or re replenishing the patient with something. And, you know, we can't assume that for the digital economy, the um, remedy that we are contemplated uh, a century ago will, will do the trick. So it's simple, it looks simple, uh, but uh, the appeal of simplicity is not what should drive policy-making efforts. So I think we, we can try harder, and uh, these various interventions should not be s thought about alone. So we, we, so we tend to go to the thing with, okay, we have a problem, we need one remedy. I think we need a cocktail of remedies like portability, interoperability, access, pricing regulation to some extent, but so we need to think very carefully about this. Matt? Thanks, yeah. Uh, so I don't think about, when you, when you talk about surgery, uh, you don't say, you know, heart surgery, you, you don't say like I, I'm doing scalpel surgery, right? Uh, so I'm, I mean, I'm not a surgeon, right? Um, uh, but you don't say I'm doing scalpel surgery. You say I'm doing heart surgery and you don't care really. You use the tools that you need, right? So it doesn't matter if it's regulation or if it's anti, uh, anti just remedy or what, it doesn't matter, right? What, you have to define what's the problem, right? And when you figure out what the problem is, then you can use lots of different forms uh, of remedies to get at it. So I would just add uh, a couple. I think this is sort of an, an and problem, not an or problem. I would throw everything you can at it, and I would add a couple of other, other um, areas. Uh, so I would try to use violations of consent decrees. Seems like those are, you know, you got teeth there, because this to me is about, a lever it's about leverage and political power, not, um, not sort of technicalities of the law. Um, I would use, you know, criminal charges, and there are a bunch of them that I laid out, but there are probably other possibilities that are going to emerge. Um, and I would also, you know, don't, don't sleep on private litigation. There's a lot of, of private litigation around consumer protection, privacy, um, 
uh, and uh, and antitrust, and it, it's all very interesting, and we're we're learning a lot. And you know, legislation. I think you could also just legis breakups through legislation. I think that would that would make some sense. And then you can also look at things like Section 230, which I think is an important part of the solution, which you know, the intermediate liability shield that has allowed Facebook to facilitate all sorts of destructive scams, but fundamentally allows them to be sort of too big to manage. Um, and so I think you got to look at a lot of different tools and, you know, we got Facebook surgery, not like antitrust or regulation or whatever. Yeah. But can I just push back a little bit yeah. because... Uh, so, so you talk a lot about the rule of law, rule of law no? but the rule of law is exactly to have enough evidence to intervene, otherwise the government could just push. So, so I wanted to push you and I want to push Nicola as well. So do you think that we have enough evidence with everything that we've seen from Facebook right now that we need to have such an extreme remedy, maybe being through regulation or to antitrust? So, Nicola, so I, I, I wrote the oligopoly provocation to say that maybe the science of competition was a bit broken and we would need to think more holistically about competition. Um, and the point I was making about experiments is precisely about that. We need a, a knowledge production system that allows us to gain learning and as we learn, uh, administer you know, remedies that fix the problem rather than satisfy the pol political demand to do something. But, but look, the last panel sort of argued a little bit about, you know, it's, it, it's clear that Google's a monopoly, but it, it, have, have they harmed anyone? The question is, has Facebook harmed right, so what's, as a result of its market power? So consumer surplus. Do we, have, do we have a good metric of consumer surplus in the digital economy? I'm asking the question. Filippo, what is your answer briefly? Because I, I not as a question. What do you think? I mean, personally, I think that we have decent evidence that Facebook has done a... It's, like, uh, it's hard to say. I, I think yes. I think yes, but I think that we have... I don't know if we have reached the point where we're going to need to have like the absolute breakups to this level. Maybe this is going to be the best solution. Maybe we should start with something a little bit weaker. Like, okay. like we haven't had... We haven't had... I think the difference between Facebook and Google is that we had a lot of failed interventions in Google, so we are warranting maybe stronger yeah. remedies. We haven't tried easier things on Facebook. Failed but, interventions uh, on Facebook, I think, was, was, Matt's, was Matt's point. Please, and not. Yeah, just a couple of comments, and we'll, we can probably go, uh, go on later, but just, just to say, first of all, uh, on harms, so just start where we, where we ended. Uh, harm to democracy, harm exactly to whom? I mean, if it's democracy, I mean, we have a, you know, media researchers at Stanford, such as uh, Matt Gatzkow, et cetera, mm -hmm. and they claim, you know, it's old media that's, that's uh, you know, creating uh, polarization, et cetera. So in other words, you know, is it back to fair doctrines or whatever? In other words, if it's about media markets versus, you know, exactly what is the problem, Luigi, you're being sent to, you, to places, the algorithms and all that. Now, with respect to algorithmic, transparency, one thing that I go back to from the, again, from yesterday, is one yesterday panel uh, where I was part of, we were talking about data availability and we did, that didn't somehow get mentioned here. But, you know, if we're gonna assess the harm uh, on democracy, say, or whatever, you, wherever you think the harm is, uh, that we need to force them to, um, to reveal data. And that starts with data about what people are seeing which is a simple data that that you know you you get from standard media you know shared most shared most watched just see what the results of the algorithm and I, I was the once an algorithmic person in my class and he was saying you saw the, you see the algorithm you have no idea what to make mm -hmm. of it so if i reveal first of all the algorithm changes all the time second i mean so realistically what does it mean to reveal the algorithm what you need we can't predict exactly how it will play out so Let's see the outcomes, and uh, first of all. So that's one way to at least get some understanding of what we're dealing with um, here. Just one quick comment also to, to the, I obviously perk up when I hear, you know, that you want to go after executives uh, criminally. It's wonderful. But, uh, you know, what's the actual law? Right now we have, you know, shareholders suing Facebook for overpaying FTC the $5 billion mm -hmm. uh, in order to protect, supposedly, Zuckerberg and, and Sandberg, as opposed to the FTC becoming so, so strong. Maybe they became strong by threatening to depose them, uh, and that's why they were willing to pay $5 billion shareholder money. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, but anyway, uh, so, so, but if you, to go to executives, sure. I mean, y you know, the DC, 
uh, attorney was suing Zuckerberg civilly of, of, for, for Cambridge Analytica consumer protection. And, you know, when I mention that, I ask people, does Zuckerberg lose any sleep over this? So only jail will possibility might wake him up, but, you know, we'll under, you know you'll have to show intent to yeah. price fix. You'll have, I mean, the bar on, on, is on fraud high. Is, on wire fraud as well. Exactly. So yeah. you're going to have to really cross a huge bar to threaten Mark Zuckerberg with anything that would mean anything to him. We, we have just a few minutes left. I want to give everybody a, an opportunity to, to have a, a, a very last thought. But I, and, and so to end, uh, I, want to, I, want to, I want to provoke all of you. And, and here's, my, here's my provocation. Um, Facebook, as I said at the outset, they, you know, their, their, their market cap has been halved in, in less than a year. Their sales growth has slowed. They're pivoting their business model. They can't do acquisitions. They're harassed uh, by the media and by various government jurisdictions at every turn. They're responding to a different scandal all the time. Um, by the way, I, I, was, I am angry at what they did to journalism, but I think we're living in a golden age of American journalism right now. The, the, the journalism industry has, has reacted and is doing pretty well. And maybe it wasn't that good before Facebook and Google dis destroy destroyed it. So anyway, you, you see where I'm going with this. At the, with four minutes left, I'm challenging the entire thesis of our panel. And so, you know, the question is, is that is that are they still as bad as, as as we thought they were? And do we really need to do anything? I'll start with you, Nicola, and, and we'll end with Luigi. But briefly, please, because I talk too long. We have only a few I'll, minutes left. I'll be very brief. I, I think, you know, it's extremely complicated. Um, we can't be sure that we are certain about the state of affairs. And so I think we would be maybe well advised to start from a position of, of ignorance and try to generate knowledge um, and, and learn from that. From that. So, but we are too impatient. Uh, that's probably the Twitter problem, that you know, we'd have to, we have to deliver uh, in the instant second. So, but you know, personally, I think that we are we are really rushing, and uh, we are not facing the exist, exist, existential risks that require that expediency. Good. And by the way, I, you know, I hadn't heard it come up once at this conference, but I told our panelists earlier, if, if you haven't read this Atlantic article about the last 10 years of stupidity in America, there's some toward the end. There's some really intelligent remedies for mostly for Twitter, but also for Facebook. And it's anyway, it's worth, I recommend it uh, because it, it's tangential to what we've been talking about. Yeah, I think Facebook's still really powerful uh, and Instagram's really powerful. I don't think, you know, they're, they're I mean, they're only worth a half a trillion dollars. Right. I mean. <laughs> right. A mere um, half a trillion. <laughs> right. Fair enough. Um, also, you know, look, if you steal a car last week and the person gets a new car, it doesn't, you know, that they still stole a car, right? Fair so enough. 10 years or 15 years of monopolization, um, it's still a crime, right? Fair and, enough. Michal, please. Yeah, I think that if they, even if the value, uh, the market share, um, if, even if it, uh, sorry, the market value plummeted, that does not mean that consumer welfare, or uh, maybe I should not use that after uh, to, um, this morning's <laughs> panel, but um, um, uh, the benefit to consumers um, uh, is going up. Okay, it might take time. This is a lengthy process, uh, and uh, and it might be that the market is seeing what would happen in a few years, but we want to fix right now. Luigi? The problem with monopolies is like with mafia bosses. Even if the new one takes over the old one, the problem doesn't get better, it gets worse. So, and the new one is called TikTok. And to me, you, you actually learn how to fight Facebook in order to prepare to, face, to, to, to fight even stronger TikTok. Because that mafia organization happens to be owned by the Chinese. What a, what a wonderful way to wrap up this panel. Uh, th thank you, everybody, for your, for your attention.